Right, so welcome again to this sort of monthly set of um, of uh, workshops that we've been we've been doing, and I hope to keep doing them roughly every month. And um, the next one will be on winter finches. That'll be identification as well as movements and some of the aspects of of what makes the winter finches really odd, um, like cross bills and their call types and all that type of thing, as well as their irregular movements and how that 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 plays into their their lifestyle. And then the one after, the month after, will be um, about understanding geographic variation. So what what it is when you have multiple types of a bird, like a song sparrow, and how all that works, and um, Hopefully that will be good, good fun. <laughs> but today we are talking about migration. And of course, you can imagine, you know, this is roughly an hour and we have a topic that is beyond words into how complicated and amazing it is. And so I'll, I'll start, you know, by uh, showing you an image that I think is just superb. And this is some years ago that shows you something that starts off as sort of dark and then it moves through towards the west and gets bluer and bluer. And what this is, these are Nexrad um, radar sites for weather. And there are some orangey yellow bits that are going towards the north and east. That's actually the, the weather. That's the moving clouds and, and rain and so forth that are moving through. Now, why this thing gets bluer as from east to west is that that is when nightfall happens. And when the night hit during this migratory period, which was in October, it lit up with birds and probably insects in the sky as they were migrating south. And you can see the density of migratory birds, in this case, in the east. And there was also a migratory push in the west, but less so, um, partly because there's also less next rat sites, but the density of migration is different in the west than it is in the east. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about that too. But the idea that in the fall, you can have this movement of birds at night mainly that starts off in the East Coast and goes to the West Coast and then continues all the way through the center of the ocean to um, Japan and then elsewhere. It's like, it's just nonstop 24 hours a day. There's a part of the world where there's nocturnal migrants going on in October, for example, and all over the world. And now we can sort of see it visually like this using using radar um and also then understand it from other techniques that are that are out there but i just think that's a cool image so we're going to talk a bit about why birds migrate the physiology of migration examples of migration how we study migration and also how birding and migration fit together so how how you you know as a birder go out and, and think about migration but first of all you got to think People knew about birds disappearing for a long, long time. And uh, there were thoughts, um, I think Aristotle thought that barn swallows um, dove into the mud in the marsh and they, they, they slept there in the mud and then came out of the mud in the spring. And that's, that's what happened. Um, some people thought birds like the barnacle goose that arrive in winter in big numbers turned into barnacles in the summer when they were gone. And there's sort of this funny, like you can almost see the look of the barnacle goose in these gooseneck, they're actually called gooseneck barnacles, that, you know, might have uh, allowed people to imagine that was the case. Also, the barnacle numbers were higher in summer when the geese were not around. <laughs> there were thoughts that little birds, where you could see geese migrating, you could see big birds like cranes migrating, but little birds, you couldn't imagine them migrating. They must have been on the backs of the geese riding along with them. That's how it happened. People could not actually understand at the time that migration by all these birds just happened. They did it, and that there was a process that was as ma as in incredible, um, unbelievable as they they kind of conjured up. It was so unbelievable they actually made stories up to explain it. Um, so that that's migration, and migration is not just a movement. It has to be a regular movement. It has to be seasonal. And you go back and forth from the same areas 
defined regions of breeding, non-breeding. So if you are a, let's say a um, crossbill, and a crossbill may breed in a certain place and move halfway across the uh, continent to the east, and maybe over there find some food for a while, and it could even breed in the east the next year and then come back. It's wandering around looking for food and so forth, but that is not an actual migration. Those things are called sometimes wanderings uh, or eruptive behavior, all sorts of other things. Migration has to be back and forth predictable to two different spots. Like a hooded oriole lives here in my neighborhood. It heads down to uh, central Mexico and then comes back to the same area here or roughly the same area and goes back and forth in a predictable manner. So that that is actually migration. And the, the real um, classic patterns are, you know, heading north in spring and south in fall. If you're in the northern hemisphere, some birds do the opposite. Some seabirds actually go north in, in the winter, for example, or some breed in the south and then go north after breeding. Those are actually unusual, and they happen because the food shifts to the north after they're breeding. So they're following the food, and that gets to the, the actual reason why birds migrate. So a rufous hummingbird may be breeding, you know, up here in the Rockies in Canada and head south into Mexico after it, it finishes breeding. But it, it is going up there to breed and also to an area that has good food for it. And when the food runs out in the winter, because right now you don't want to be a hummingbird in Alberta, you head down south. And it is not as much about cold. Birds can actually deal with cold quite a bit. Um, it's about food. So you move to where the food is. And um, some birds move further than others within the same species. And that is actually interesting to sort of ponder too. Why does a you know Western sandpiper, some of them winter all the way far as far north as British Columbia, yet others go all the way down south to central Chile. Why does that happen? Um, but overall, it's about energetics and food, not cold. The first birds that were looked at in terms of migration were waterfowl, and in particular, geese and things are really predictable, and they came in big numbers and, and flowed in. You know, you could see almost the movements heading south. And this gave the rise to these sort of highways in the sky called the flyways. But the flyways as a concept are not really applicable to most birds. So we think, and we still talk about them, and especially management and government agencies always talk about the Pacific flyway and the central flyway and the you know, Atlantic flyway. Most birds don't follow these flyway paths in the, in the way that the geese and the cranes do. So keep that in mind that it's a great concept and it's a really amazing idea to have these sort of rivers of flow along river valleys and, and you know, along the coastline, but it doesn't actually function for a lot of birds. Some other birds are using completely different ways of moving north and south. So um, something to ponder. And we, we learn about migration mainly by observation, seeing when things arrive or disappear. But there's also uh, more technical ways, uh, like bird banding, especially if you have color bands that can be read in the field. Um, tracking technology, whether it's satellite or um, now MODIS, uh, all sorts of other ways you can put something on a bird and figure out where it has been. There are ways to sample the chemistry of a feather called stable isotopes that will give you an idea of where a bird was based on the chemical signature of that feather. And then, of course, radar, which I showed you, that shows you at least when the migration is happening. You don't necessarily know what it is or exactly, you know, how fast they're going necessarily, each individual, but it tells you quite a bit about the volume of migration in the sky. So, um, you know, people think about birds as, you know, oh, you come from someplace or visit us and where they're from and, uh, the whole migration concept, when you think about it as this cycle that is moving north and south, it's really hard to sort of then just think about where a bird is actually from. So something like a sooty shearwater in, in the ocean, it does this. These are satellite track sooty shearwaters. And these ones that were actually banded in New Zealand breed in New Zealand. 
Um, some of them, there's a different population of breeds in Southern South America, but they are doing like a big, huge figure eight pattern all over the ocean. And then they're spending months at a time in non-breeding areas like California, Alaska, Japan, Russia. And those birds are um, there a long time too. So the bird breeds in a certain place. It spends the non-breeding part in, in a, another place, yet it also crosses the entire Pacific Ocean over a shorter period of time. It is from all those places. It belongs in all those places. Um, but we often think of you know, our birds as being the ones that breed here or where they breed as their place. Um, you know, you can probably, I've, I've got my, this um, bit of bar here that doesn't show, oh, there it is, 40,000 miles a year, which is huge, their round trip uh, flights, yet it's not the longest one. In fact, Sudi Shearwater now is the second longest migration known because this is, um, you know, you, you, um, it's what has been tracked and measured that we can sort of say, oh, this is a really long migration. But the record holder is the Arctic tern. And the Arctic tern, as you might know, breeds in the Arctic and they actually go and spend the non-breeding season in the Antarctic, way down here. These are birds that were tracked from breeding colonies in um, Greenland. And what, what is kind of neat about what they do, and th these are in, a, in the Atlantic. We don't have the same info for birds in the Pacific. It's possible that theirs are longer or shorter in their migration. But if you think about that round trip and the fact that they don't just go north-south, but they're doing these more complicated migrations, it is a huge, like 10% longer than the Sudi Shearwater flights. And if you put it all together and realize that they, they um, they breed, I mean, they live for a long time. A lot of seabirds live for a long time, 30 years. It's like going back and forth to the moon three times in their life. That's how much these birds fly. And then we think, okay, that is really, really difficult. But I think it isn't for a bird. Um, this is just what they do. This is normal and part of their routine, just like you can walk for several miles and you could do that every day. Um, it's the same kind of thing. It's what you do. What I do think is um, interesting, and this happens over and over again, is that northbound and southbound migration routes are different. Um, they don't just track the same route back and forth. And this is for most birds. I also think it's interesting that some birds, once they get to the south, they actually went way east and west compared to others. And then once they were in the uh, wintering, er non-breeding area, because it's actually the summer down there, um, they hung out by the ice flow, and it's thought that they then molt very quickly uh, all of their feathers and all hang out right at the edge of the ice. And if you think about going from the Antarctic to the Arctic and back and forth like that, seeing summer in the Arctic and then summer to the Antarctic, this is the creature that sees most sunlight of any living creature on Earth because it goes from 24-hour daylight to 24-hour daylight. The only time it sees night for many of them is when they're migrating. So interesting. Um, so to migrate, what do you got to do? You got to first know where you are. You have to know what direction you need to go to, maintain a course, and then you got to know when to stop. And we know elements of, of, of this in birds, but we don't know the whole picture. So for example, we do know that birds know where they are because you can you can take a homing pigeon when it's its home place. You can take, take it, you know, 100 miles away, and it'll come back to its home box, its house, and um, it homes. That's why homing pigeons are, are, are called homing pigeons. So they know where they want to be. They know their, where their house is, their GPS of that spot. Um, they know where they've been left. So they know where they are, and then they can make it back. But we still don't quite know how they know exactly where they are. Much more easily understood is knowing what direction to fly in, but you still have to know where you are, where you want to go. You have to have that map in your head. That part, the scientists don't quite know how the birds do it yet, but we know they do because we can see them do it. Um, and then these experiments for homing, um, some of them um, with wild birds were done in the 1960s and would actually not be possible to do today because it's, well, it's considered 
moderately cruel to take a breeding shear water, for example, and move it away from its breeding colony and then time how long it takes to get back because, well, it's breeding. But back in those days, they did this kind of thing to figure out if birds could actually home back to a place. And over 300 bank shear waters from a breeding colony were taken, some of them all the way across the ocean to Massachusetts, and then timed and figured they figured out by they had a band, you know, how long it took them to to get back. And some of them, you know, it took like 120 days to return after they sort of sorted themselves out. And then some of these were were done, they were actually relocated again. And they would do it much, much quicker the second time around. So there's a learning component, but there's also they knew where they wanted to be and they know how to get back. So that is that is sort of the key of those experiments. I'm glad we know that. I'm, you know, it's but um, I'm glad too that we don't do that kind of uh, experiment anymore. So you got to know the direction of your goal and you've got to maintain course when you're when you're flying. One of the um, experiments, a set of experiments that were done again, like in the 60s and into the 70s, were done in these, like a funnel. It really is a, a funnel called uh, Emlin funnel because they were pioneered by a researcher, Stephen Emlin. And he would take birds and put them in this funnel. And at the bottom, bottom of the funnel, there was an ink pad. And when the bird was had this migratory restlessness towards this direction, it would like jump and jump and jump and jump, and then it'll make a dark mark from its inky feet on one section of the funnel. And then they could measure what the, the directions that these birds were interested in moving. So generally north in the spring and south in the fall here in the Northern Hemisphere. And then they could put them underneath, for example, um, a, a planetarium and they could shift all the stars around and then they would see that the birds reoriented depending on the stars. So they were able to figure out, ah, they can use the stars to navigate. They can use the stars then to know which direction I want to go in and, you know, maintain that course, for example. Um, other experiments were done with magnetics. So the, the field of, you know, of magnetic field experiments have been done with, with sun migration. They have compasses, these birds and multiple different compasses in each bird. Pigeons have been studied quite a bit and um, how these compasses work, uh, they, they also have them almost like in a structure of which one they, they use most reliably. And when one of them's not available, they switch to the other compass. So there's like a star compass, a sun compass, and the magnetic compass to, uh, to start with three. Um, some birds actually orient by landscape features. They actually learn where they're supposed to be and follow a river valley. And they will often learn from their parents how to migrate. And these are very special types of migrations. They, the cultural migrations that are more like this tend to be in geese, swans, and cranes. So they migrate as a family unit and will actually teach the young how to migrate and where to go, and where to stop, and what valleys to follow. Most birds don't do this. Most birds actually have a, they will even as youngsters leave and migrate on their own without ever even seeing their parents and just know I got to get from here to there. And then they follow their compasses to get down there. Um, so I described Stephen Emlin's work that he did a lot of it with um, indigo buntings. And he would, uh, for example, adjust photo period. So the length of, of the daylight and he created a situation where a bird was feeling the restlessness of migration in the spring, but then he made the photo period look like instead it was August, so it was fall. And then they started orienting to the south rather than to the north. So they also have an internal clock, clock and calendar. So they know roughly what time and place it is. And even though they had this migratory urge to go to go north, when they were you know, sampled from, from you know, a spring migration, he was able to make them orient to the south by changing the bird's thought that he was actually in fall rather than in the spring. So it is really interesting to, to know that these birds have all of that information going on in their head. There were also pigeons that were tested with the, the Emlin funnel um, using a little hat that was changing the magnetic field so the Earth has a magnetic field north, south, and so forth. And then you could shift the magnetic field with a little magnetic hat. 
And if it was overcast, um, they get got confused. Um, but if they were able to reset their magnetic, what the magnetic field should be based on what they saw in the sun, they sort of overrode all of the confusion caused by the odd magnetic field by looking at the sun. So that sun compass seemed to be more important to them than the magnetic field. Um, it It's uh, interesting to think that these birds can see all that and somehow understand it. Things that we have no ability to, I mean, I think we don't, maybe we do. Some people are really good at just knowing where South is, just almost seemingly intrinsically and others are not. We're not like birds. Um, what, one of the hugely amazing stuff that has happened in the last while is that people have started understanding a little bit more about the chemistry of what goes on in a bird's head to example, understand the magnetic compass. And in their eyes, they have this huge molecule um, that is has a, a polarity. So it has a positive side and a negative side in terms of, you know, it's, it's elect electric polarity. And it's, will such a move um, electrons in and out of this, this um, parts of the uh, molecule, and it can actually align or know where the magnetic field over that bird's head, which direction it's going in and what angle it's going at by this having this, in, your, in their eyes, they have this magnetic field detector and they don't quite know north or south but they know towards the pole or towards the equator. That's what they know. And if you imagine up here, you sort of see the, the earth and the way that the magnetic field is, is that at the poles, the field is going straight out at a 90 degree. At the equator, it's parallel to the surface and in between it's at different angles. So they can detect this angle and roughly know, okay, I am heading southward or I am at this, this situation here because of the angle of the magnetic field. And they do it by this crazy, huge, complicated um, chemistry that they have in their eyes. So uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, and I don't think we have that <laughs> as far as we know. So these compasses, sun compass, star compass, celestial compass, they, as I said, they, they will structure these um, in different orders, depending on which one is available. But the sun compass seems to be the main one that they will use if, if it's there. If, it's a, if they're moving at night, they can't use the sun. They can use a celestial compass and they will always be looking also at this magnetic compass. Um, and the young pigeons, for example, use the magnetic compass before they actually learn to use a sun compass. And one of the reasons is the sun compass, you need to calibrate it. And calibration of that sun compass comes through experience. And um, that experience involves seeing where the sun sets and the angle at which the setting sun happens. If you have an internal clock, as birds appear to have, the, the actual angle and timing of the setting sun, knowing how long the daylight was and so forth, tells them a huge amount of information as to what latitude and you know what part of the world they're they're at, and they will reset a lot, a lot of their other compasses, like you know based on that setting sun. So you can trick them with mirrors and and have them orient the wrong way by by making that setting sun information the wrong information. So we know they actually use it and that they can learn from it, and that's pretty cool as well. So um. That kind of the physiology of some of the stuff and how it works. And then there are some birds like the Arctic tern, the other ones we were, um, Sooty Shearwater that we were talking about, and um, the bobolink that have to cross from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere. And what seems to happen is when they get, well, the equator's over here, when they, they get to the equator, a lot of things start becoming more complicated because they don't have the angle quite, you know, the angle of the, um, magnetic field telling them much information at that point other than you're at the equator. But 
they start using other parts, celestial compass and so forth, to let them know to keep going south. And once they go south past the equator, they can then start using the magnetic compass and so forth and not be incorrect because they only know going with the magnetic compass to go to the poleward or to the equator. At the equator, they could make the wrong choice if they weren't calibrated com correctly and start heading north again in the in the in the fall, for example. So crossing the equator appears to be an interesting problem for migratory birds that they get around by calibrating with sun compass, celestial compasses, and so forth. But the magnetic compass becomes really problematic in that in that situation. So they know how, basically which direction to go and how to get there, um, maintaining course using these compasses. We don't quite know how the GPS works of how they know exactly where they are, but it could be all these angles of the sun and so forth and having an internal clock. And then they got to know when to stop. And that's, that's the other part that is classically difficult to understand. Some birds may actually smell their home. So if they're heading to, towards a breeding colony, a lot of seabirds probably smell the colony and know they're at the colony just because they're, they have a really keen sense of smell, kind of like salmon that smell their stream. And um, it's, it's that that they might be doing. Other birds may just have a rule where if they have a good habitat and you know their migratory urge starts petering out as they get to a certain day length, they will just look for the right habitat and slowly kind of settle into a non-breeding or a breeding situation. They might know after they've done it once, when they're not juveniles, exactly where they want to go. So they go to that spot. They might be looking for just high food amounts and may shift around in the non-breeding area to areas that have more food. Or it might just be genes. You know, we have to think about even creatures that migrate that aren't birds that are, let's, let's call them simpler, although they're not simple, like migratory butterflies. And they probably have a much more genetic rule to like just go here to this um, area or latitude, stop there, and then boom, you know, you're at your migration endpoint. So there could, and there could be like the compasses, multiple things working in conjunction. So you know, when to migrate, um, well, there's spring and fall, that's, that's key, but also uh, some birds migrate in the day and some at night and some do both. So if you start looking at migration, you will see that you don't really see sparrows flying overhead, you know, because at, they're migrating at night. So you might hear the chips of a sparrow if you're into that kind of thing listening. Some migrate during the day. You'll see robins, you'll see purple finches, house finches, a lot of finches migrate in the day. Um, birds like swallows, although swallows can migrate at night. Um, and um, the diurnal nocturnal thing is, is variable because some, some birds, if they have to, will migrate in the day like they're crossing a long stretch, such as like the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and others um, will just, you know, essentially migrate during night and not much else unless they have to, for example, you know. So it depends. So it's not hard and fast, but think about hawks. They migrate during the day and the thermals and so forth. And if they're crossing a big, big crossing, um, some of them may migrate at night, including peregrine falcons. Uh, falcons may be one of the few raptors, even though they're not hawks, that migrate uh, into the night when the right situation happens, like they're crossing down into the islands in, in the Caribbean. Um, so let's see, let's see some examples. We told you about geese and cranes and social migration where you learn from, from your um, parents. Um, one of the things about these birds are also tend to mate for life. So the parental pair is a multi-year pair and they will take their young back with them to their wintering areas. And they'll, they'll learn, they'll, then they'll, you know, go back and forth at one time with the parents and then will probably return to the same breeding and wintering areas as their parents, but not exactly in the same spot. Um, here's a brant. Uh, this is a brant that I um, actually photographed this one as a vagrant in Hawaii, but I did find a brand here once with a band and in, in Half Moon Bay in California. And it I was had been banded up here way, way up in Alaska. So these birds are going 
from California to Alaska. And what they seem to be doing is actually moving north along the coast and then going all the way around Alaska. And some of them breeding in areas of Alaska, others actually breeding way further north in the islands of, of um, Arctic Canada. And uh, they don't cross the land much. Um, they actually will go on this coastal route. And the different populations of Brant have culturally learned different breeding and non-breeding ranges. So um, to give you an idea, there are different types of Brant. They're all the same species, but uh, we talk about Atlantic Brant that have these real pale bellies. There's a one in Europe called the dark bellied Brant that is darker. And then we have black Brants, which in the West Coast, which have this really, really dark look, a really big collar, and then a huge white area on the flank. So these three different subspecies of Brants breed in different areas, and they migrate to different areas. Although um, it, it seems that the reason why we have these different population subspecies is because there originally was a shift in their migration. And then when you're once you're in a migratory pattern and you learn it from your parents, you stick to that pattern and you don't mix with the other brand. So what is weird is to contemplate that you can be in the, this area of the Arctic. And if you're on this island, you winter all the way down in Puget Sound. But if you're on this island, you will winter in Ireland. And it's due to the history of what your great, 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 great grandparents did. And you're still following that cultural migratory route. And it's been so long that you've actually started looking different than the birds on the adjacent islands that go to the other migratory spot. There's pretty, Awesome, <laughs> what migration can do to birds. The most highly migratory um, hawk we have in North America is the Swainson's hawk, and it's an insect specialist. So it went looking for insects, and that's why they move from um, mainly, you know, central North America and the prairies. Although we do have we do have them in California, down to um, the pampas of Argentina and Uruguay. And they are just looking for insects. They are not interested in mammals. So red-tailed hawks, other hawks will stick around North America because they're mammal eaters and they can find voles all year round. Swainsons are specialists on insects and in particularly flying insects like um, dragonflies or, or grasshoppers. So they go to where there's a high, high density of flying insects, big flying insects. And that's why they're doing that migration. So again, it's about food. And I actually studied these when I was a, a university biologist. And it was neat to see that they were catching all these dragonflies down in Argentina. Question is also like, why does a bird like a wimbrel, sanderling, you know, sandpipers, various things, why do they have some birds that winter, let's say in California, they breed in Alaska, winter in California, others go all the way to Chilean areas, others will go to Ecuador. Why does that happen? Um, and if you if you can winter in California, why not just stay there? It's not such a long distance. And what people have done is studied the energetics of migration in birds like red knots. And it turns out that if you're a red knot and you winter, let's say, in a cold area like the Dutch, um, you know, um, not wetlands, but uh, um, the tidal areas, versus going all the way down to Africa, you have a lower cost in migration, but you have a higher cost in maintaining warm and actually finding food. Often those areas don't have as much food and they have other, other things that are difficult. So these different strategies are all equally valid. And um, often the ones that go further south are the ones that actually go to places that are richest in food. So and also sometimes less competition. So there's more food at this time of year, January in Chile or Peru than there is on the coastlines of California. So if you fly that far, you took a bigger hit in your flight, you're getting a bigger reward in food. So that's how these different strategies can survive, you know, um, in, the, in the same species, for example. A, a pattern that is um, very common in migrants, these are fox sparrows, is that the birds that winter, I mean, breed farthest north tend to be the ones that winter farthest south. 
And in fact, in fox sparrows, the ones that breed farthest south in Vancouver Island are resident. The ones that are on the Alaska and Northern British Columbia coast actually go to Northern California, Oregon. And it's actually the ones that are in Alaska that go down as far south as Central and Southern California. So they hopscotch over each, each population. And this leapfrog migration is really common. If you are seeing a bird in the way, way farthest place that they winter, it's probably breeding in the way, way farthest north spot that they breed. Peregrine falcons, the tundra breeding peregrine falcons go all the way to Chile, Argentina. Not all of them, but many of them do. The, the ones that breed farther south in North America don't go as far south, and some of them just stick around here all year round. Um, I mentioned um, isotopes and uh, the chemistry of feathers in a bird. This has been looked at in a lot of species and not just birds, fish, all sorts of things. But um, here we have um, Wilson's warbler and a huge breeding distribution and also a large wintering distribution. Um, various bird observatories actually took, when they were banding birds, Wilson's warblers, they were able to take a feather out, like a tail feather, and keep it. And then they were able to see where that feather came from. Um, and if you know where that feather is molted in, where it grew, you can tell where that bird is from based on the chemical signature of the feather. Because there's these general chemical signatures of water and various chemicals in on the earth. And so you have that mapped, then you can go, hmm, this bird probably is from here, it's probably from there. You don't have an exact spot, but you have a good idea. And what they found out is that Wilson's warblers that are from the east migrate further south. Wilson's warblers from the west migrate and winter farther north. And the timing at which they move through areas of the west depends on how far north they're going. So the earliest arrivals are actually the ones that breed in the uh, in California, for example. And then a little later, you get the Oregon ones and the ones from British Columbia. And the last ones to migrate through in the spring are the ones going to Alaska. And you can you can see that in the chemical signatures. Um, here is a, a picture of Eastern black versus Western white uh, Wilson's warblers. Here's a little map of where they are. And in general, in this case, they're going you know generally further south. Um, but not all. Some some Western ones are going further south. Then, uh, and that's probably because there's more Western Wilson's warblers than Eastern ones. But this pattern of Eastern birds going further south than Western birds happens over and over and over again. And I'll tell you about it here with Swainson's thrush. The Swainson's thrush, another bird that has a really wide distribution in North America and winters all the way down to South America, so further south than the Wilson's warbler, and they have two populations. One that's generally called the olive back thrush from the east and north, and then the western one that's the russet back thrush, which is a little, little warmer in coloration, but they're both still considered Swainson's thrushes. This is the western one, this is the eastern one. And if you start looking at their um, uh, situation, one thing is that the white ones and the black ones are genetically distinct from each other. There's a northern and eastern group, that's the olive back, the black ones, and then there's that white group, which is the russet back thrushes. So they're genetically distinct. And you, this is a little picture of the differences in, in, in genes here. So there's multiple differences. And all the white ones clump with the white ones, and all the black ones clump with the black ones. And what you're seeing here is that this is totally the effect of the last ice age. You had one thing at one point, it was Swainson's thrush, and they were divided into two areas of breeding by the big sheet of ice that was in North America. And you had a Western group that remained and an Eastern group, and they started evolving separately during that time and probably migrating to different parts of the world, right? And then you took away the ice and these things came back together again you know, and and didn't quite, they were different enough that they didn't quite just blend into each other. Their history is still there um, from that ice age time. So here you have migration of the, 
the ones are in the north and in the east, so the olive backs, and they go further south into South America, while the, the ones that are heading towards um, Central America, Mexico, are the western ones. And you can see here the white ones in the breeding area. These are the, these are the russet um, western ones. They're wintering in southern Mexico, Central America. The ones that are from furthest north and east are mi migrating down south all the way down to Bolivia. And that is over and over and over and over again happens in, in birds that are unrelated. And it's the effect of that history of our geology and, and ice that is in the birds migration. So there's another picture of what it looks like, the Eastern and Western birds. And um, what is particularly um, to me, fantastic is you have some birds that are almost touching each other, but they're of that different migratory type and they retain their historical migration, although they're almost touching. And it suggests that maybe actually these have gotten to the point of being separate species. So it's, it's, uh, it's there uh, and maybe it's a, a, you'd have to define exactly what you, what you're trying to do with, you know, species, what, what is uh, enough to, to call a different species, but it's it's really important info that's not only in the genes of the bird, the look of the bird, and also the migration and where they where they go to. Geolocators are one of the the bits that people use to understand migration. These are like they're they're little um, elements that collect light data, so they know when sunset was and when sunrise is, and just like the bird. And figure out where it is based on sunrise and sunset. If this, if you put this on a bird and you know the time and date that you put it on and you record that and you let that bird go, it'll detect this, this um, geolocator um, data logger will detect that information and you can download it from the bird if you catch it again. So birds that are breeding in the same area or breed in a box like purple martins have been looked at in this way or wood thrushes and various other things. The key is that you have to get the bird again. There are now some, some newer um, trans, uh, transmitters that will download the data when to a cell phone tower, which is kind of neat. So you can have it all collect up the data and then it downloads to a cell phone tower and then you can get that data from, from the, uh, from the, 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 the thing. <laughs> and uh, in this case, these are cheaper than using fully satellite tracked um, um, birds, you know, and those are more expensive satellite trackers. They're bigger and uh, they're getting smaller and smaller, like all technology. But this has been something that's been used, for example, to figure out how where purple martins from the east go to winter and also wood thrushes heading down to South America. And you can track the different individuals. And um, like with many birds, there's an elliptical migration. They don't go north in the same way they go south, probably taking advantage of the winds. And with birds like purple martins and some other ones now, they've looked at veeries and other things. In winter, they don't stick around necessarily in the same place. They have sort of a, they move around within the wintering area looking for food and so forth. And um, you can see how fast they can migrate too. We are now, um, getting into a world where MODIS is becoming very, very important. MODIS is a system developed in Canada that is very cheap. And what you do is you, you take old school technology of essentially radio towers. And if you can have a you know little um, radio antenna that is tied into the system, if a bird has this little, little, very light and quite cheap element that it's carrying with it, uh, and it emits a little radio trans, um, you know, message. Modus picks it up, and if two or three towers pick it up, they can triangulate where the bird is, and then they know where that bird has been. The key is you have to have a lot of Modus towers out there, like all the, all around the the space, in order to pick up what bird has gone by. And this has been increasing greatly. So we have more and more of them in North America, especially the East but still a lot of uh, places lacking. As this network gets bigger, we'd be able to put little modus transmitters even on insects and be able to see what they're doing. Um, the, 
I alluded to this with uh, a couple of birds I talked about earlier, but there are two different migratory systems in North America, an Eastern and a Western migratory system. Eastern birds tend to go further south and they migrate more quickly. So they, they are much more timed, especially in spring to, to just go in mass and in high densities because they're trying to get to very specific places at a very specific time. And that Eastern migratory system is what creates the, the, the fact that all of our big spring migratory places are all in the East, you know, whether it's in the Great Lakes or Cape May and so forth, they, they it, it's a different way that migration happens. It's a shorter time span. While in the West, birds can start trickling north in, in late February, March, April, May, and, and it's a longer stretch of time that the birds are going through and not as dense. They're also coming from farther north. So these two very closely related species, Townsend's and black throated green warblers, have a totally different you know, migratory um, style. They see they the Townsend's in the west and some of them winter much further north than any black throated green, but they don't winter nearly as far south as black throated greens do. But the, the area of breeding has a huge, huge um, latitudinal span, less so in a lot of Eastern birds, um, especially given that there's not as many down in this South. So it's, it's much more of a narrow band. And that's what creates the faster and more boom kind of migration in the East versus the West. And they're again following the history of their, of their genes there are birds that migrate only when they have to, um, or at least, or they will, I shouldn't say that, they, they migrate in winter, in the middle of winter, when they have to. Some birds, if they're in the non-breeding place, boom, they stop, they have no ability to migrate anymore. They don't have the physiology going, but birds like yellow rump warblers, if the winter gets tough, they will start a second migration during the middle of winter. Robins do this, a lot of other birds that are that will winter farther north, and they shift their migratory latitude depending on where the food is. And these are called facultative migrants. So when the, when things go bad for yellow rock warblers, they will move south, even in the middle of winter. Yet for a uh, yellow warbler, they they don't. They they winter where they or the non-breeding seasons is where they are. Um, when these birds stop during migration, they want to go to a place that has really good food and is safe. Um, people have studied stopover sites have found that adults know the better places to stop and they take the better habitats as opposed to young birds. If you go to the Great Lakes in the fall, for example, and there are forests that are away from the lake that have more mature greenery and so forth. And then there's you know, forests that are right along the lake and in some of the migratory hotspots. The migratory hotspot birds are almost always youngsters and there's less food for them there. It's actually better for us as birders to find them in densities and easier because there's smaller trees and you know, not, a, not as great a habitat, but the adults are all inland in better habitat away from the prying eyes of the birders. Um, when you have birds in the hand, you can look at their fat level. So this is a yellow warbler, and in a lot of places, bird observatories will measure fat levels. And just to give you an idea, this you don't have to look at this whole chart, but there are different fat scores here for adult male yellow warblers. Zero is no fat. Six is like the heaviest fat you can have. And you can calculate how much fat that is and how much they can fly based on that fat level. And to give you an idea, this is in kilometers. The highest fat level for a yellow warbler gives you about 876 kilometers of fuel, a 500 miles. You have no fat, you can't go at all, you know, zero, 146. So they need to be fueling throughout the, the migration. And the less fuel they have, the less they can go. And if weather goes bad, they don't have buffers. So then you can start thinking about the conservation implications of having nice forests for birds to stop over at, or nice wetlands, or nice, um, you know, mudflats, in order for them to be able to get to the next spot 
appropriately. Um, it's almost like, you know, range anxiety when you have a, an electric car. <laughs> there are also things that are just coded into a bird in their genetics that keeps them safe during migration. Here's a really interesting example from Europe. These are bird, these birds are called black caps. They're a, they're a European warbler. And so they're breeding throughout Europe, but they have the, the Mediterranean right south of them and they're trying to get to Africa. And essentially most of them will go around the Mediterranean one way or the other, right? But they don't go across the Mediterranean and they, they wanna minimize also their time through the worst of the Sahara desert. So if you are uh, to the west of this magical line, you will go towards Spain, towards the southwest, before you start going south. If you're east of this magical line, you will go towards the southeast before you go south to this wintering area in Eastern Africa versus Western Africa. And it seems to be genetically coded. And if you look at the Emlyn funnel birds and what their direction they're going to in September, October, the birds from Germany are going towards the Southwest. The birds from Austria want to go Southeast. And then in November, their mig migration shifts. So they know that at this time of year, I gotta go this way. And at this time of year, I gotta go this way. And so they have that coded in their genes. It seems to be genetic because if you take a bird from east of that line, that gene pool versus west of that line, it, it's just different. And then they know to change that depending on what time of year it is. So for us, which songbird, like little bird, heads the farthest south? You know, we talked about the Arctic terns and so forth. It, it swallows. Barn swallow is our, for a songbird, it's our longest migrant of any North American bird, little bird. And it goes all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, some of them, and most of those are probably, if we were able to tell you where they were from, I bet you would guess where they're from. They're probably from the East. Our Western barn swallows are probably going to Mexico. Again, even within this one species, my guess is that there's that East-West divide, but barn cliff and bank swallows. Chimney swifts go pretty far South. And then the other, the other stuff that goes well South are the big birds, shorebirds, raptors, uh, some of the raptors, terns, seabirds, and so forth. I think the um, just sort of the wild stories of migration before we sort of wrap up with a few things here is uh, Bartail Godwit. Bartail Godwit, uh, breeding in Alaska, does the most incredible nonstop migration from breeding grounds in Alaska all the way to New Zealand in one flight, like one flight. That's it. And the, they go north in two flights. Either one of these northbound flights is amazing by itself, but to actually do one flight that is that long, and is, this individual started on the 30th of August, ended on the 7th of September without stopping. So multiple days, like over a week flying, 7,200 miles, and they, they load up with fat, all the fuel they can get, so much so that the last day that they're up in Alaska, they start actually some of their gut you know, that they don't need because they're not going to eat, starts getting small. Everything else gets small and they just add the last amount of fat, wait for the right wind, and then they just go. Um, it is it is it's pretty crazy. Um, there are birds that um, migrate like the, again, elliptical migrations like these peregrine falcons. This is an individual actually that I saw that had a, a um, transmitter on it in Chile. And I was able to know that it was it was a bird called Sparrow King because I knew the day I saw it and I, I told the researchers and they said, oh, you actually saw this bird because we have it from our data was exactly where you were that day. And this is a bird that was migrating all the way to the Arctic. Um, and what they're doing is probably following shorebirds. So they go north down where many, many, many of the shorebirds are migrating north and then they're following south. Uh, trying to find anything they can in the winter. What is interesting about them, though, is that the shorebirds can out um, compete them in that they they fly south early. So peregrine falcons take a long time to breed and hatch their young. A shorebird can actually do it much more quickly. So shorebirds migrate super early in this in the fall. And nobody kind of understood why they left the Arctic so early, even when there's still a lot of food. 
And it's thought that they might be trying to avoid predation because they know the peregrine falcons are going to be timed later. And in fact, the peregrines timed a little bit more to the juvenile shorebirds. And there's one shorebird that doesn't do this and migrates late, but it actually sits in the Arctic in big, big masses, you know, where if a peregrine was to come along, they kind of would see it. And that's the Dunland. So it actually delays and probably waits till a lot of the peregrines have moved south before it migrates. There are some of our birds, like um, pectoral sandpipers, that breed in the Arctic, and some of them winter in South America and actually go to the Siberian Arctic, and while others migrate down to, to um, um, Australia, and they're mixing between the two continents. And it's thought now that these birds that migrate between continents, and there's not many, the many ducks do, might be of concern for us in our modern world in understanding the movement of disease and bird flus and different kinds of influenzas. So this is becoming of importance. Um, the black pole is one of the highly migratory warblers from the north and the east. And back in the 1960s, um, there was a, a man, um, Nisbet, who said, you know what black poles are doing? And this was before any technology to sort this out. Said they they staged in stage in the Northeast in Massachusetts. We don't see many of them down South into Florida, very few. They're all up here and then they disappear. So he said, I think they're going over the ocean and flying nonstop to South America. And some of the ornithologists at the time said, you're insane. That's impossible. There's no way a bird like this could do it. And he was right. It takes 88 hours for them to fly from Massachusetts to South America nonstop. And scientists of the time could not believe that this was possible. They were shouting matches at the ornithological conventions saying that Nisbet was insane. And why was he coming here as a scientist to talk about such craziness? But he was right. Um, and we've always had this thing with migration of never believing that it could be so incredible. Um, and uh, it's it's cool. And I, you know, it's too bad that he didn't get to uh, see see that, you know, see it all come together um, in with today's technology. And finally, a little bit about vagrants and and um, migration fallouts in the east are often at Gulf Coast sites and places that are coastal or in the Great Lakes. And it is very, very weather dependent. There are a couple of things that happen. One is that birds in the spring are moving north. And if they have a long nonstop flight, let's say across the Gulf Coast, I mean the uh, Gulf of Mexico, if bad weather hits when they are doing that crossing, they will stop at the very first bit of land they can stop at because they're not going to waste more energy flying into a storm or in a storm and then they all drop out in mass in places like the Texas coast. This happens in the Great Lakes. It happens in other places. We don't get that fallout effect in the West as much. Um, downwind displacement is when you have birds that are migrating and they hit a storm. But before they hit the storm, you can often have winds that are going against you. So let's say a big storm is going along the southeast and north nor'easter kind of thing going up and you're migrating like the black pole warbler is migrating south and it hits winds that are against its mode of travel there's a point in time the bird is going to say not worth it turns around and then flies downwind and then it's coasting downwind and it'll land in the first place that it can seek shelter downwind displacement is huge very important and it it happens all the time in the northeast if the right situation uh, you know, um, birds find themselves in a situation and they will sometimes get shifted north of where they start and you'll get yellow-breasted chats in Newfoundland and in multiples of them. And they're just doing something that seems wrong, but they're saving energy by going downwind. And they haven't hit the storm. They never actually got into the major part of the storm. They just got through those winds and went downhill. We had a big flamingo outbreak in the in North America this, this you know, just last season. And people talked about this um, hurricane that came through and it 
it shoved all the flamingos. And there was this idea that in the eye of the hurricane, um, this is always the idea that all these birds were in the eye of the hurricane, you know, moving, you know, north and they got entrapped in that. But what ha was happening with these flamingos is probably something different. Flamingos have never shown up like this before. We've had hurricanes many times before uh, going through these. But what I think was happening is the flamingos were moving from the Yucatan to the Caribbean. They actually do these movements every so often where they move from these two places where they have a density of, of, of breeding and wintering areas. They were probably in the middle of moving. The storm came, they started getting those winds and then they started just going downwind. They got downwind until they landed in places all over the Northeast. And um, they weren't all tattered up and messed up as if, as if they'd been in a storm. They actually looked pretty good. And they just happened to get caught in this sort of once in a lifetime event that that storm hit just when the big push of flamingos was crossing the Caribbean. Um, in the West, we have deserts, coasts, uh, in terms of the where, where birds land and vagrants and so forth. But we have way more Eastern birds that are lost in the West than there are Western birds lost in the East. And there's a reason for this. Um, Dave DeSanti, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, while he was go looking for a rare bird in uh, Marin County, he um, did experiments in the Farallon Islands, which are offshore from San Francisco, and vagrant birds land there, including birds from the east, American red starts, black poles, you know, you name it, they all land there. But he could put them in an emlin funnel and try to figure out what they wanted to do. What were those birds kind of thinking? And they all were going south and west. And he thought, why are they going southwest? And he realized that in their brain, in their, in their code or whatever it is, because a lot of them breed in the north and then head down that eastern migratory route just to head down towards the southeast and then head, head around the uh, Gulf of Mexico or, or through the Caribbean, they should have been going southeast, yet they're going southwest. And he thought that they have like a mirror image situation, almost like a mirror in their head where they're seeing the opposite direction of where they should be going. Not in the north-south sense, but in the east-west sense. And he called this mirror image disorientation. And he thought certain birds for some reason have this go wrong, go, go haywire. And the reason why it doesn't happen from Western birds to the east is that most Western birds are just going north-south. They're not having any east-west component to their migration like the ones in the east. So they are not likely to suffer in the same way and be found in the West. Yet the North-South mirror image misorientation does happen with birds that are South American that may winter in Venezuela. And then when they're about to head back to Argentina, instead of going South, they go North. And that's why you can get birds like fork-tail flycatchers landing in New Jersey or somewhere. This one is New Hampshire. And in November, because November is spring for this bird, and it was trying to head south from Venezuela. Instead, it went north. And if you look at the distances between Venezuela and Argentina, it's about the same as the distance from Venezuela to New Hampshire. So they have a north-south mirror image misorientation that's going on in these birds. There you go. <laughs> that's, I think, a ton of things I wanted to tell you about uh, relating to migration. You can just imagine, we just dipped into different aspects of this and uh it's pretty exciting and i think um maybe next time i would i would probably do another one of these on migration we'll we'll take one of these topics and kind of expand on it i would love to find out a little bit more about the different techniques that people use all these different you know technologies that are being used now especially because modus um they're there's going to be this element that's going to be sold called, I forget what it's called, that's going to be able to record birds in your backyard. And they may actually start acting like a mini modus yeah, like where we could actually, yeah, in our backyards, backyard. have a, a bird, a, a thing that's detecting birds that are flying over. Which would be really cool. But next time it'll be winter finches. Um, we have the recordings of the last two um, workshops up on the site. And if you're interested in tours,
Thailand with Peter Burke, Cuba with Molly Brown and Arturo Kirkconnell in April. And we do just have uh, openings all of a sudden in Birds and Wine in March, Chile, Argentina. But 